Είναι μεγάλη χαρά και μεγάλη τιμή ε, που ε, ο Νίκος Παπαδημητρίου και ο Γιώργος Σανίδας με προσκάλεσαν σε αυτό το καταπληκτικό σεμινάριο. Ε, είναι και μια στιγμή συγκινητική να, ε, να μιλάω ε, ε, σε ένα σεμινάριο που στο το Μουσείο τουλάχιστον είναι στην Αθήνα. Εκεί ξεκίνησα τις α, σπουδές μου ε, στο Πανεπιστήμιο Αθηνών ε, με μεγάλη ε, χαρά και δεν ξεχνάω και ποτέ ε, τους καταπληκτικούς καθηγητές μου στην Αθήνα. Ε, και φυσικά θέλω να ευχαριστήσω και όλους τους συναδέλφους στην Ελλάδα και στο εξωτερικό με τους οποίους, τους οποίους, με τους οποίους έχω συνεργαστεί και παρουσίασε ο Νίκος όλες μας τις συνεργασίες. Ε, υπάρχουν πολλά πράγματα που πρέπει να γίνουν στον αρχαιολογικό χώρο και οι συνεργασίες είναι πολύτιμες. Ε, so. Και θέλω να πω και συγγνώμη που θα μιλήσω στα αγγλικά. Έχω πια ζήσει στην Αμερική ε, περισσότερα χρόνια από ό,τι έχω ζήσει στην Ελλάδα. Ε, αλλά θα χαρώ να πάρω από φοιτητές ή άλλους που μας παρακολουθούν οποιασδήποτε ερωτήσεις στα ελληνικά φυσικά. My talk today focuses on skill sequences and spaces. And I am extremely pleased to be part of this webinar series hosted and organized by Papa Dimitriou and Sanidas, two esteemed colleagues who themselves have set technology and artisans on the forefront of, um, of scholarship. I specifically would like to um, thank uh, Sanidas Yorgos uh, for his um, kind hospitality in Lille uh, some years ago. I also want us to think a little bit, if we can go a little bit back in time, uh, how ceramics uh, um, were everywhere in ancient cities. They were cities of clay. Sometimes we focus only on the most, um, um, on the, uh, most luxurious or uh, lavishly decorated pots, uh, but um, I'm uh, giving you here a short uh, selection of all other um, artifacts that needed to be produced in clay, whether they were for cooking, uh, for light, uh, for um, the, the sewer pipes, uh, um, underground that you, we wouldn't see them. <clears throat> um, the coffins, the clay coffins, even some uh, 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 dolls for children uh, and transport amphoras. Uh, not, of course, to forget uh, the ceramic tiles as well. So there was a huge ceramic industry that, and sometimes we study only one small section of it. So I just want to see us all to see the totality of that industry. Uh, Nikos very kindly covered uh, how I have um, come to um, recover as much information as possible uh, from the, uh, the world of the ancient Greek potters. I went a little bit backwards in uh, 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 starting from kin studies and then moving to wheel studies, although in uh, reality um, forming, whether in wheel uh, or in other methods, precedes the kiln firing. But indeed, uh, um, I started with what we call the traditional data sets of iconography, of um, um, archaeological data. And then I added uh, more layers from ethno-archaeology, uh, from um, experimental archaeology, and digital humanities and social networks. 
for uh, at the laboratory for traditional technology just down the hall from me right now um, um i had the honor to be a co-director with several of my colleagues uh, at the school of anthropology and it has been a great center for creativity and for research uh, cynthia jones i would like to thank for being our resident potter for several years now and working with us to recreate uh, replicas of somehow sometimes iconic vessels you think we think that we know everything but uh, just uh, trying to reconstruct uh, and going through all the steps really opens up our eyes and we uh, by going methodically over the various steps we can also spot uh, gaps uh, in uh, current scholarship some for example um, famous objects don't even have um, um, profile drawings made of them. I know Nikos likes very much uh, uh, experimental archaeology, so I'm putting a little bit of a, of a snapshot of uh, a few projects that are happening out there already now 10-15 years. Uh, um, I'm highlighting the work by Phil Saperstein on recreating the archaic roof tiles and doing uh, recently um, energetic calculations. He also works a wonderful with digital reconstruction. So whether it is a digital reconstruction or a manual, um, uh, bringing up the color, the um, <coughs> roofs of uh, the Temple of Corfu to light. Uh, and some um, other projects, Bronze Age projects of the Tastes of the Minoans by Geraldine Morrison and Julie Hruby on the Grills of the Mycenaeans, uh, along with um, uh, some of my projects with uh, recreating a Greek kiln replica in Tucson and recreating uh, a Greek uh, wheel replica as well. I'm uh, um, highlighting a good uh, and an excellent resource for um, keeping um, informed of the latest uh, experimental um, approaches as the Exarch, um, and they are um, um, wonderful in um, keeping the pulse, taking the pulse of all the projects going around. Um, another, um, um, in, in addition to conducting the experiment, there is great value in actually recording it and making it uh, uh, publicly available. And I would like to highlight several of the initiatives that Nikos Papadimitriou has been involved. Uh, um, uh, I highlight here um, the one by, doc by Dr. Morero on recreating a um, cycladic marble vessel, um, uh, a lifetime work of Dr. Lenia Lupi of recreating uh, um, the technology of um, Athenian pottery production, and perhaps one uh, less known uh, but uh, uh, outstanding, uh, a collaboration of Dr. Susan Langton from the University of Missouri and a um, um, student, an MFA student, Norlin Nosri, in 2012 uh, to recreate uh, the um, Dipilon Amphora. I use these um, resources as educational resources in my classes and they, uh, they guide my research. And more recently, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston published a beautiful do little uh, documentary uh, on uh, how uh, Andokidis uh, came up with the um, uh, dis uh, discovered, uh, uh, introduced the red figure vase. They have some of the best uh, examples of bilingual vases in Boston. And last summer, um, I um, recorded several pot painters at work uh, um, in ancient Corinth uh, under the auspices of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. So uh, having these resources available uh, really promotes our research in, um, in um, wonderful ways. Um, reaching out uh, in my research, I, I 
I'm blessed to have the help uh, of people who actually know how to do things and just uh, teach about them like sometimes uh, we academics are. And I uh, highlight uh, uh, some of the people whose knowledge they generously shared with me. You may recognize some uh, from, uh, um, from Greece, uh, um, Lucis, uh, Thanasis Katsaras, several people from Corinth, uh, from uh, Mognini, and even uh, Toby Schreiber, the author of the famous book on uh, recreating um, Greek vases, who had come to Tucson and um, and even climbed on our um, on our kiln. I also want to highlight an ongoing collaboration. Um, I have the great honor of uh, being the host uh, institution for uh, uh, Professor Marco Serino from the University of Turin. He's also listening to this talk down the hall from the lab. Uh, and he comes to us with a prestigious fellowship uh, um, from the European Commission and um, my colleague in the, at the University of Turin, uh, Professor Ilya and I are his academic supervisors, but he has uh, spearheaded a fantastic uh, and ambitious um, project uh, on combining experimental archaeology, social networks, uh, RTI, uh, digital uh, microscopic analysis and archaeometric for the South Italian uh, um, ceramics, which are his specialty. Um, he, he represents to me the model of the new generation of scholars where um, this um, this multi-layered analysis of ceramics is is um is taken for granted you cannot just do one thing and i'm highlighting some of uh, our initiatives here at the university of arizona and you can see more on uh, um, professor serino's website agathocles.net I also want to thank uh, my family uh, my husband um, alan may has uh, has uh, um, walked with me everywhere, has built this kiln in Tucson, and our uh, daughter um, can recognize Penteskufia Pinakes in uh, any museum video recording, even in Leiden last year. So I couldn't have done all this without their encouragement and their insight. I also want to ask uh, the basic question, why care about Greek ceramics? Um, I know that perhaps these questions are not very common um, in the land of, of um, uh, who created them or even in Europe, but sometimes we are um, expected to say why, why we do these things we do um, you know, in a remote, uh, wild wild uh, west uh, um, town and it uh, it um I'm, it prompted me to map out very quickly and um, all the beautiful uh, and important insights we can learn from studying all types of ceramics not just the decorated one i'm i'm pointing out a couple of um um, the traditional approaches, uh, the iconography, regional styles, connoisseurship, uh, but I'm also adding the more recent one in the last few decades, um, functional analysis, um, workshop, mobility, life history of pots, of course, economy, trade, uh, identity, um, and archaeometry. Um, this... Um, Sociogram does not put value, more value to one approach than the other. Um, it just highlights how many different, uh, how lucky we are to have so many different approaches to um, interpret uh, the archaeological record. We are indeed uh, in a wonderful position to do so. I'm going now to uh, uh, go, go through some basic steps uh, of a potter's schedule. Uh, I put Greek uh, in parentheses because several people, uh, several potters, uh, whether a Southwest potter, uh, an Egyptian potter, and, uh, a, a Roman potter, uh, would uh, 
would have to go through the same sequence. They can skip uh, steps, but they cannot reverse steps. So it, to some extent, it's a universal schedule. Um, they dig for clay, they prepare this clay by levigating and um, removing impurities and adding uh, temper uh, if necessary. They form the pot in various methods. They have to let it dry for a short time. They refine the shape. They burnish the shape. I'm going to keep uh, going on the left column which is the majority of what um, of what the majority of workshops would have gone through. I'm making a I'm trying to make a big point here. <laughs> so they will have to let it dry even longer. They will put it in the kiln and they will unload the kiln. Um, so this left column gives us the um, operational sequence for the majority of. Um, uh, the, the pottery workshops in the ancient Greek world and in most uh, ancient cultures. So um, uh, for, for pots that are not slipped. And then I'm putting the optional, the optional stage of decorating that pot. And you can go with just uh, applying slip on it or go all the way and decorate it uh, um, exquisitely. And then I have put there our different techniques, uh, the black figure, the red figure, and other techniques. So um, again, the point I'm making here is that uh, if we study only the decorated uh, pots, we study the most uh, uh, complicated one, uh, which was not the majority of the workshops out there. A few slides just to um, acquaint everyone with the basic manufacturing stages. You, you collect the clay. Um, the Penteskufia Pinakes have uh, the, these unique representations of the workshop going out there, collecting. You can see how this is a multi-generational enterprise. The older um, uh, workmen who know the good deposits, uh, uh, they instruct, uh, they have as helpers, as an assistant, the younger ones. Um, it's a... Um, it's, um, um, valuable knowledge to know your um, your clay quarries and especially for the sleep is a knowledge that would be also um, guarded. So from going out in the nature and uh, uh, procuring your resources, um, you start with um, a knowledge set right there. Then you come to the workshop and you levigate that clay. Um, um, you have um, these settling bases, basins. We have some from um, ethnographic uh, record. We also have some excavated, for example, uh, in Thassos. Uh, this is a time consuming stage that sometimes we forget. And I always want to put in the time dimension. Every time uh, Exekias or Euphronius uh, stands in front of a pot and starts painting, and that's the uh, phase we focus most, uh, there has been all this uh, time investment, uh, labor investment to get to that point. So uh, to me, it's an, it's an important uh, time dimension that we cannot compress. And um, you then... Uh, um, Prepare the clay either by walking on it or wedging it, uh, and then you have it uh, ready to be placed on the wheel. I'm using one technique. Um, it doesn't mean that there were several more, but one technique that was uh, uh, mostly in use uh, uh, for from the... Um, uh, for the pottery that we study most most often um, and um, the and you can see here even again the multi-generational um, efforts of uh, workshops at Mognini even learning to prepare those cylinders so that the potter can start with the um, with the 
exactly the, the clay that he needs, exactly the amount of clay that he needs so that his streaming is minimum. So you, you try to facilitate the work of the potter as much as possible. Throughout this lecture, I will uh, highlight a lot uh, the size of a pot. Um, it has been um, um, an insight that I gained from talking to potters in Tunisia in my ethnoarchaeological uh, work where they kept emphasizing uh, I don't work in uh, pots over 20 centimeters or over 40 centimeters. So they will cluster several shapes under a size bracket. Uh, we as archaeologists pay a lot of attention in categorizing specific shapes, but we don't go to the next step that is clustering uh, different shapes in the same size um, spectrum. So to me, that has been uh, a, a guiding principle in my research uh, for the last several years. Uh, and I always make an effort to, um, to discuss the size and of course to discuss comparative sizes between, you know, an Aribalos uh, um, and, and the Hydria. I'm emphasizing the size for one more reason that uh, underscores the entire organization of the workshop. If a workshop specializes in a certain um, size, uh, they will uh, um, acquire those specific clay quantities. They will know how long it takes to uh, prepare the clay. They will know how long it takes to dry them. They will have uh, shelves and space to accommodate um, the stacking of these uh, pots to be um, to dry. They will also develop techniques of stacking and of firing uh, in the kiln. So it is a fundamental choice that will affect their entire operational sequence. So sometimes we, we, we naively ask them, can you make different shapes? So this is a naive question. I asked it <laughs> several times. It's not if they can, but what will be the economically sound choice uh, to organize their time, their labor, their resources? Um, the wheel apprenticeship, uh, I have um, written about it. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, cross-culturally, cross we know it was a very um, labor intensive and a lengthy apprenticeship. Uh, but what is uh, wonderful in um, ancient Greece is that the philosophers, um, our textual sources who preserve uh, no names of ancient potters will use the wheel apprenticeship uh, as the paradigm of gradual and um, slow mastery of any skill. So when they were telling to the um, aristocratic students uh, how they can master um, th their oratory skills, their metaphor was you have to build up your skills. You cannot skip uh, basic uh, uh, learning, basic training uh, and jump uh, to the most complicated um, oratory construction or ceramic construction like epithos. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful proverb and uh, um, I always uh, use it for uh, in a number of, uh, difficult, of different situations. Um, you cannot skip the foundational steps. Um, I'm, I am bypassing uh, a, a big uh, um, topic uh, that the, for which we have uh, um, several outstanding researchers um, in our communities like Professor Alupi, Professor Richard Jones, uh, um, the um, wonderful team from, um, uh, from uh, um, Democritus. Uh, so, um, and that is uh, the um, archaeometric analysis of the sleeper uh, and of the of the of the added clip and of the clay. So this has been uh, um, uh, uh, there have been great contributions on this topic. Uh, um, I just have to cover everything here. If if you look, uh, I have prepared this slide uh, just so that we can see um, um, 
a, a panoramic version of uh, what uh, prehistoric potters and painters and historical ones worked on. So the use of orange sleep for the scenes has been a long-term uh, uh, skill. Um, they knew how to do it, uh, they applied it, uh, and of course they had to always live with the fear that the firing of that sleep will be uneven. Um, but in the archaic times, we start having uh, some additional techniques, uh, especially on these decorated ceramics. Use of incisions, use of additional colors for the black figure, or use of relief lines and use of um, I'm sorry, I cannot see my um, and use of uh, um, diluted sleep for the red figure. Um, so. I want, to, I want us to see what potters and painters did for a long time and then some specific time moments where new things come in. Um, things that we take for granted, inscriptions only appear in the archaic um, um, inscription next to figures or maker signatures. I know that we have some inscriptions on uh, the Dipilon in Okoi, but um, the, the majority of that. Mythological themes or daily life themes. Um, I know this audience knows all this, but sometimes I have to highlight uh, that the, um, uh, the classical image that we have of, um, of an Athenian pot uh, uh, actually had uh, a very short uh, history. Um, and I'm going here now to my new love, I would say, uh, that has come to the foreground of my research lately, always uh, uh, with the, after the advice and the insights of the painters. And I want to thank uh, very much uh, Thanasis Katsaras, who has always welcomed uh, my questions. Here you see from his workshop uh, how he, he um, frames the entire scene before he goes in and puts uh, the, the specific um, the specific ornaments. That framing, the stability of making the lines is the fundamental apprenticeship stage uh, for a painter. We tend to um, 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 ignore it, I was ignoring it, but now I will never ignore it again. And, uh, um, it, and a lot of times the painters would say that, that a lot of that uh, framing the, the pot uh, was a lot of mental exercise prior to applying it on the pots themselves. Uh, in um, in uh, uh, Last summer in, at Corinth, this, has, this became also a, a major uh, um, point, uh, the importance of stabilizing that hand uh, and making uh, your, um, your, um, um, your boundary zone. So whether it is geometric, archaic, later on um, a classical pot, uh, they frame first their pot. Then every painter will draw on a long tradition of their uh, regionally specific decorative syntax uh, schemes. And I want to thank my class. We just covered those uh, regional styles, regional um, geometric styles, but also, of course, later archaic as well. And um, I want us to recast these choices as uh, um, choices for identities of these different region, regions. Um, this long, long rooted uh, choices that are passed from one generation to another become even more important when we start talking about mobility of potters, mobility of painters. What are their transferable skills? If we think a little bit with, with, modern, um, with modern terminology. 
then the painter will do this uh, work that is uh, drafting, the preliminary drafts, and work by uh, Sanchita Balahadran at the Getty, at the Johns Hopkins, um, and of course augmented with the work that uh, Marco Serino is doing right now for the South Italian uh, uh, pots and also uh, Diego Ilia in Turin. So there are several uh, teams that are um, that expose to us uh, these preparatory stages uh, uh, that even accomplished uh, painters will have to go through to finalize their their um, their scene. Sometimes um, <laughs> when I try to to convince uh, my students or others about the importance of some. Uh, elements in a, in a sequence, sometimes the strongest argument is to remove those the, the, that phase and see how um, much less richer the final uh, um, surface is. So in, uh, in the black figure, we can um, bluntly say, oh, it's a um, silhouette with sleep and some incisions, but the skill of incising these pots uh, is, uh, is an acquired skill. I have taken a, a scene from the Kiji Olpi and I have removed in Photoshop the, um, the incisions and you can see how much flatter it is. So um, every skill of the painter needs to be um, valued, whether it is framing the scene, adding them, adding the incisions, or adding this what we call the filling ornaments, this proto-attic crater with all these uh, uh, filling ornaments that almost give uh, life uh, and movement to the pot versus the other one that is a little bit, you know, flat, I would say. And the same, of course, um, issue with the red figure. Um, everything counts and everything needs to be balanced. Even the, even the endless filling rosettes of the Corinthian pottery, it, they require skill so that the final impression is a balanced impression. So next time you look at an Arivalos or an Olpi from Corinth, just, uh, just appreciate the rosettes as much as the polychromic effect. Um, the painters in Athens had a couple of um, different uh, options uh, um, how to decorate their pots. I emphasize this is again a specific niche of the Athenian industry. So around the, around at the end of the archaic times and the beginning of the classical times, we had the black figure in Athens. They experimented with the red figure sometimes on the same vessels. But they also had uh, um, this experimentation period of about um, a generation where they um, introduced short-lived techniques, whether it is the white ground or the coral end. But they settled uh, for red figure um, uh, as they came out of that experimental phase. Of course, many of us know that black figure does continue. So it's not a, a, a total break with the prior technique, but the predominant technique is red figure. And I want us to look a little bit uh, how they did this uh, transition. Um, uh, it is a very uh, smart, economically smart, labor smart uh, transition, and it is Slowly. So if we take um, a, 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 a bilingual vase, we see that the only area of the vase they, um, they experimented with, they modified, is only 35% uh, percent, uh, um, of, of that side. So it is actually a small area, they didn't have to change uh, their forms, they didn't have to change their um, sleep, uh, their firing techniques, their uh, um, bordering designs. Uh, they focused on that uh, scene and they introduced that new um, 
technique. It will take almost two generations to go from this um, um, targeted uh, small scale uh, change to something that is the, um, the apogee of uh, red figure, the entire vessel, black slip, uh, and the wonderful single figure um, with um, um, wonderful physique uh, uh, and details depicted. And sometimes I, I have come, uh, and you'll see my argument a little bit later, sometimes I come to think of the red figure as uh, the celebration of the black sleep. So I know that it's not the black figure, but it is, uh, uh, you definitely had to had to trust the person who applied the sleeper sometimes more than once uh, um, who provided for you for the painter the background to render this outstanding um, um, scene and um, i keep uh, in the last uh, few months and i have to thank publicly uh, my dear colleague kathleen Lynch and her work uh, in the athenian agora who um, in our conference uh, in um, turin with um, uh, serino and Elia last october reminded us uh, how much uh, um, sleep pottery just sleep pottery appears in the athenian agora so every time you look at the pot, and I also want to thank uh, our, our um, first year graduate student here, Noah Simmons, who prepared this uh, preliminary 3D modeling um, as, a, as an attempt of a new research project to, to quantify how much sleep uh, is placed uh, on, on, um, on the Athenian pots. And I just, uh, I just want us to highlight not only the potter and the painter but perhaps this sleep uh, um, applicator the sleep um, application uh, assistant perhaps uh, the painter himself who had to ensure through several layers of sleep preparing the sleep and uh, um, applying the sleep so, and even applying it more than once um, that um, really um, highlighted the, what we normally focus on, that is the painted scene. I also want to mention a beautiful um, insight uh, from uh, the Corinthian artists who also, when they talk about, when they decorate a pot nowadays, they also refer to it with its total size. I will decorate a 30 centimeter amphora. So both for the potters and for the painters, the pot is an entity, is a totality. And I think the more we can approach um, this um, wonderful artifact, artifacts and in their totality and not only zooming in in certain parts, uh, excluding the others, I think we can uh, understand how potters and painters collaborate uh, and a um, vast number of other topics. I'll be happy to expand uh, in any questions later. And we are moving uh, to, um, um, we, you have to let it dry after you finish the, um, the painting. Uh, and you have to let it dry and then it goes to the um, firing. I, you would have never uh, uh, believed me and I would have never believed somebody else if uh, they told me that they can throw a pot, that's a potter, uh, to his um, mother in Tunisia, a pot across, uh, 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 you know, across three, four, five uh, meters and catch it and put it in. Granted, it's not a euphronious crater, but, and they trust each other, but uh, they handle the vessels um, from, you know, from the beginning to the end. Up until that point, the clay can be recycled. And I can show you, I can, I show you here some of the recycling pots in Mognini or outside the, the workshop. After that, you can only recycle the clay um, as temper, as 
feeling as building material, but you have lost your own original form if something goes wrong. Up to this point, you have lost your time, but you have not lost um, your, uh, your material and your form. And this close interaction with the vessel is uh, an, another aspect that I have started um, um, developing in recent years uh, and going back and seeing how potters and painters have this intimate uh, um, relationship of handling a vessel in positions that no curator <laughs> would uh, allow any scholar in any museum to do, and, and we would not even think to do it ourselves. But, um, but at all times, they have uh, this full recognition of all the um, dimensions uh, of a pot, its weight, uh, its um, it, it's weight as, as yeah it's weight is the one that we rarely uh, but also it's height it's uh, thickness and uh, um and as i said it's weight now you can see these are these are um, pictures that we all know but uh, sometimes we forget and one um uh, by our dear friend uh, dima romantic in corinth this past summer uh, this um, in-depth research uh, I have been doing in, um, in holding a vessel uh, led me to ask uh, uh, another good friend who has almost making all my thoughts tr come true, Yanis Nakas, to recreate uh, this scene uh, from the um, uh, shoulder of the Caputi Hydria, a standard reference uh, in all in all discussions of iconography of uh, potters uh, at work, uh, but we miss this, um, what this person does here. We almost all miss that <laughs> poor guy at the edge of the scene, but he's holding the vessel and another one comes to take it. This one, a, a great reference um, to the apprenticeship. Another one is moving it. So, there is a lot of movement of, of vessels uh, by each individual potter throughout its creation and by various workers in the workshop. And that leads me to make a, a brief uh, reference. Um, it's an ongoing research about uh, the weight uh, of the, of the uh, ancient pots and the energetics, uh, how much labor goes in to make a pot uh, to form a pot and to decorate it. So more and more, um, please look for the weights of the of the pot and how they would have been handled, not only in the production space, but also in the consumption contexts. So here I give some of the largest ones out there, um, decorated ones, the Euphronius vessel and the Panathenaic amphoras, both empty um, and uh, uh, full, and also the, their weights before firing and after firing. Along with them, uh, uh, guiding my research on energetics uh, and again with input from uh, practicing potters, I have made a preliminary attempt uh, to. Um, to chart the different shapes uh, and their times, their total time without um, counting intervals of making the separate pieces and putting them together. So that chart still needs to be improved uh, to not only include um, active time, but also active and waiting uh, intervals. And in the most recent um, test uh, um, case I undertook, uh, I tried to slow down each process from making uh, the Euphronius face to decorating it, counting both active time uh, and idle or drying time uh, and come up with some approximations of how long it takes to shape a, a, a pot and how long it takes uh, to paint it. Uh, these approximations, you know, are, are just um, a basic reference, but it also helps us put uh, 
time, uh, the time dimension into the production output. Um, I tell my students that making pot is not a, 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 a competition how many hamburgers you can you can eat in two hours. It's how can the workshop organize its in its output in a way that is um, that is um, um, that is uh, uh, economical sound to them and makes the best use of their resources. I also put this uh, uh, picture up uh, so that we all have a sense that the potter and the painter, the, the workshop will not see the black slip uh, um, for the entirety of the production of a vessel. It's a post-firing effect. So I, I, I describe the workshops as sea, as, as oceans, as seas of uh, hues of orange uh, that the um, that the painter will um, work with uh, and. Um, have the confidence and the skill and the knowledge and the experience that this hues, um, this spectrum of uh, oranges uh, uh, will turn uh, into this uh, ideal uh, uh, bichrome result. The ceramic kiln, um, uh, this was an introduction to the firing process. Sometimes we tend to say the least for the for the topics that we have been uh, working on the most, uh, but we have um, our basic uh, iconographic evidence from uh, Athenian and uh, Corinthian depictions. We have several hundred archaeological examples, but unfortunately, most of them um, um, preserve the lower part. This uh, kiln from Eretria is, uh, is, a, is a great exception of preserving uh, so nicely. It's a scara, it's in the museum. Uh, um, and then uh, um, we look, we miss uh, in all our archaeological examples the upper part uh, of the kiln. And um, that um, the potters, I just want to use these two depictions to show how the potters will um, um, control the firing uh, without uh, digital uh, thermometers. They would have had their test pieces up here and they would climb on the stocking channel and with the hooked item, they will take them out. This is what modern potters do as well um, and test the different um, uh, firing of the slips, and they also had uh, uh, that peep hole in the loading door that allowed them to control the firing in the mid-level. So whether you want to see how the firing progresses in the mid-level or in the upper level, they had covered it all. Um, the lowest level was a little bit uh, um, a disaster zone. Uh, this is the level right above the perforated floor. Um, perhaps I can just say quickly for those that are not too familiar, the, a, a basic Greek kiln has the lowest floor where the fuel goes, a perforated floor for the heat to come through, and a separate floor um, chamber where the pots are stuck. Uh, most of them are one, uh, meter in diameter, and that is a basic design throughout the Mediterranean. But that lowest layer, as I said, is a disaster zone because this is where the heat from the combustion chamber is the strongest. So uh, it, will, um, it will pretty much destroy anything you put on the lowest level. What did the ancient potters did and what do the modern potters do? They recycle defective vases and they uh, fill them with unfired pots, like these little miniature ones. So these um, pre-fired vessels um, serve as a, <clears throat> as a um, protective layer to these destructive uh, temperatures. And I'm thinking, for example, that the Corinthians might have done something similarly using their bigger vessels to stack their Ariba loil. 
I'm going to go rather quickly. I have a few more slides, Nico, but I'm almost done. Uh, about the sequence of um, of what happens inside the kiln. It's um, it's um, one firing, but it has three distinctive phases. Again, we are talking for the decorated vessels. At the beginning, where you have a lot of oxygen, um, the, um, for most of the firing, you increase your temperatures, your um, colors will stay mostly the same, um, a little bit a darker hue. Then you reach uh, in very high temperatures, very short period where you block the input of oxygen from the combustion chamber and from the chimney and your entire pot, pot turns black. That's your first reaction that the entire pot goes through. And it's very short lived and it is, you know, the highest um, skill of the um, workshops of decorated pots. Then you open those um, areas again, that combustion and the chimney, oxygen re-enters the kiln. The pot, uh, uh, the pot is split into two areas, an area that is covered with slips that cannot go a second reaction. So it keeps the color from this phase. And the rest of the pot um, that is not covered with slip is more porous and is able to go a second reaction, uh, reverting to the original color from the beginning. So uh, some areas will go through one reaction, the ones with the slip, some will go um, through with two. And that's the same idea here as well. Uh, tons of things can go wrong. We have the King Demons uh, uh, from a poem. It's the only time that we hear these names. And sometimes you don't know if you wanted to have fewer <laughs> names, but encountered in more, more texts. But it shows us that the potters knew all the problems that could go wrong uh, in a um, in um, firing and you had to be patient throughout the drying, the firing, the cooling. A pottery is a craft of patience. <laughs> I don't always have patience, but th they did that. Uh, in our um, experimental replica in um, Tucson, we used the archeological and the archeo iconographical uh, evidence uh, to recreate uh, that kiln, uh, the most difficult part was the, the perforated floor. Um, we have fired it 10 times and we'll do one more, uh, um, if all goes well, one more firing uh, this April. Um, th that experimental attempt really taught me a lot. It was a good um, um, lesson along with the um, ethno-archaeological work in Mokmini, how you can read the flames at night, just like in antiquity, um, and how even a small area of one meter in diameter takes uh, um, a dedicated effort uh, to fill it up. We never filled up this kiln with just uh, um, volunteer work. So what we consider a small kiln, it takes a full-time workshop about uh, two weeks uh, uh, to fill it up, if not more. Um, you load the kiln uh, carefully. That is also another skill. Sometimes the master potter loads the lowest level, the one that will keep everything else in place. And the potters had a variety of specialized or even informal furniture to hold it all together. And they were okay. <laughs> they were okay if things did not um, came out uh, museum perfect quality. So the uneven firing is the norm, not the exception. And I would like to say perhaps that in the current discussions of that some uh, decorated pottery have, might have gone through two firings of three stages for corrective purposes, perhaps. I am a little skeptical because 
you correct something if it is not the norm. But if the norm was to appreciate everything that came out, uh, if it was not smashed, uh, um, then why would you uh, put together again your vessel through um, this very uncontrollable um, process uh, with the hope that it will be corrected? But the discussion continues. In short, uh, I want us to see that poor vessel, how many transformations he, he, it has gone through throughout its production. It's like almost a living uh, um, um, organism. And even our uh, potter, even last week, she said, uh, if, a, if a pot um, flattens and you, you can like breathe in it and it will come back to its shape. This is just in the very early stages of uh, shaping. It will, um, dry, during the drying, it will um, lose weight and it will shrink. And in the firing, it will also lose weight and it will shrink. And then the slip will go through um, color differentiation. So it's a lot of things. Uh, to pay attention and the potter knew at all times and the painter how these uh, uh, transformations took place. I'm, I'm uh, finishing with um, four slides uh, on, um, on the spaces. Uh, um, I know and I admire um, um, deeply the great work by um, the co-organizer, um, Yorgos Anidas on um, highlighting the urban distribution of um, of ceramic of workshops, but I would like us to pay more attention in the internal arrangement of the workshops. Um, and I'll um, go here, and then if I there are some questions, I can highlight the other slides. Uh, um, in the past, uh, including me, I, we would focus more on uh, putting a dot, a spot on a map, where are the workshops. Uh, a great, uh, some great reconstructions of um, archaic orientalizing workshops at Prignas were um, available in the 90s. We all knew these depictions of interior space and exterior space. And we also had the ethnographic uh, um, data sets uh, of, or, of traditional workshops in concrete or on Sifnos. Um, we also knew from, ethno from anthropological studies how far away a potter will go to, uh, to procure its, their clay and their temper. So at some point is economically not viable to keep walking forever, you just move your workshop. But in my work in, the, at, um, in Moknini, I quantified uh, the space uh, of a workshop and its function. So I could, and it, it, made, it was a little bit a make me feel good <laughs> project because we always complain that we don't find the kilns. Well, the kilns are 13% of the workshop. So it's a little bit of luck if you if you see it. We never find the wheels. Uh, this is like 3%. And if you are lucky enough to hit them, that hole in the ground. But what, um, and you, they didn't have an, enough storage. That was a big uh, eye opener for me. Um, traditional potters and ancient potters do not produce for stockards. They go through short economic cycles. They produce, sell, get income. They start a new cycle. And it is different, of course, for the um, humongous industries of Roman Sigillata later on. So um, that may, made me um, look again in these um, production units. How would the people move around? Um, how much of that space needed to be uh, um, free? Um, the, the amount of space doesn't... Uh, um, tra doesn't translate uh, into bigger workshops. The amount of space has to do with the size uh, of the pot. So the smaller pots need smaller space, the bigger pots need bigger space, but it is not an one-to-one -one correlation of um, 
crucises. And coming to the end, uh, I also want us to see um, one more phase, the, the, trading, uh, the trading of these um, vessels. And uh, sometimes I think that ancient tradesmen, tradespeople, and modern ones would even provide the producer some hints uh, for um, best performance of their pots because they, and they could even perhaps exchange uh, techniques of stacking their vessels, the way you stack them in the kiln versus how you stack them uh, in the, um, in a boat, a small boat or a bigger one to go to um, Etruria and further to the west. So whether it is ethnographic, um, photographic archive or these beautiful reconstructions uh, uh, by Hein and Kilikoglu about stacking um, transport amphoras. Uh, there is a lot to be learned uh, from about technological choices from that uh, um, transport uh, uh, phase. And here there are some great pictures from Sifnos. You can see the wheel and the boat uh, and the stacking uh, coming out from one to the other. So my last slide uh, is that we all can join our expertise, uh, keeping everybody and ourselves a little bit uh, um, in balance, uh, calibrating approaches, um, um, my great colleagues uh, who do uh, population studies of, um, um, of um, ancient Athens, attribution rates, uh, uh, ceramic industry, demographics, domestic consumption, we all can pull uh, our respective data sets to keep our reconstruction of ceramic industry somewhat in balance. Thank you immensely. <laughs>